it is impossible to overstate how vital Western military aid is for the war effort in Ukraine. Military supplies provided by the US-led International Coalition have enabled Ukraine to first stay in the fight against overwhelming Russian firepower and then push the Russian army back. Ukraine's modest arsenal of old Soviet-era weapons would have been insufficient to successfully oppose the Russian army, and the influx of Western weapons has given Kyiv a fighting chance to succeed in this war. But Western support has not been immune to criticism by Ukrainian officials and the public, along with Western analysts, due to delays in the supplies of pledged weapons and hesitation in crossing self-imposed red lines when Ukraine asks for new types of weapons. Such criticism and public display of disappointment, particularly with the United States' hesitation, is often accompanied by an open question. Does the West really want Ukraine to win? This video is sponsored by our kind YouTube members and patrons, without whom our work would have been impossible. Patrons and YouTube members get two exclusive videos weekly and can currently watch the completed series on the First Punic War, Peloponnesian War, History of Prussia, Italian Unification Wars, Risorgimento, as well as dozens of other videos and the continuation of our Pacific War series. New series is on the Russo-Japanese War, Albigensian Crusades, Xenophon's Anabasis and much more are being released for our backers right now. You can join their ranks via the link in the description and pinned comment to get exclusive videos, early access to all public videos, access to our schedule, wallpapers, and a special Discord server where we're very active, and much more. Thanks for supporting us, we couldn't be doing it without your help. Before tackling this question, we have to give you some context. Western anti-tank weapons, artillery, MLRS, tanks and armoured vehicles, air defence systems, long-range missiles and much, much more, have transformed the Ukrainian army fighting with a lot of resilience and heart in this war into a truly formidable foe for the Russian army, which was universally accepted as the second strongest army in the world before this war. Before the start of the war, the United States sent Javelin portable anti-tank weapons and Stinger man-portable air defence systems while Britain supplied the Ukrainian army with Enlor portable anti-tank weapons. This support reflected the general pessimistic mood among Kyiv's partners with regard to Ukraine's chances in this war. Western governments hoped that the aforementioned weapons would make the Russian invasion as costly as possible without expecting Kyiv's victory. As Ukraine's defense minister Reznikov rightly said, At first, our partners prepared us, in fact, for a guerrilla war. Therefore, it was more about the defeat at a short distance. Stinger, Javelin, Enlor and Piran have been lucky for us. But as Ukraine defied expectations, it became clear that an outright and overwhelming victory that Putin hoped for was not going to be possible. The Ukrainian army withstood the initial Russian pressure and now required new weapons to decrease Russia's firepower and halt the Russian advance. Ukrainian requests for its allies to close down its airspace and protect it from the Russian aerial strikes were predictably rejected, as right from the start of the war, the US-led Western coalition made it clear that it was not going to take any steps which could lead to a direct confrontation with Russia. But the Ukrainian government got at least some of its requests fulfilled at the time when the AFU was under heavy pressure of overwhelming Russian artillery in Donbass. After weeks of public requests and private talks, the United States agreed to send several HIMARS MLRS with mid-range precision munition capability in the summer, which played a key role in transforming the general situation on the battlefield. HIMARS destroyed scores of Russian military assets, artillery, military bases, ammunition and fuel depots, transportation nodes and command centers, forcing the Russian command to remove some of its most valuable assets further away from the front, out of HIMARS range, which exacerbated Russia's supply problems. This helped the Ukrainian army to stop the Russian advance in Donbass and then make the Russian army's control over the right bank of the Dnipro untenable. The loss of Kherson and an embarrassing crumbling of the Russian front in the Kharkiv Oblast forced the Russian army to rethink its strategy in Ukraine. They launched regular drone and missile strikes on Ukrainian cities and civilian targets, like Ukraine's energy infrastructure. The lack of modern air defense prevented Kyiv from effectively defending its assets. While many older Soviet-era S-300 and Buk air defense systems had been destroyed by Russia since the start of the war, even before the Russians started regularly attacking Ukraine's infrastructure, as early as the spring of 2022, 
The Ukrainian government was asking for Western air defense systems, particularly the Patriot system. But it took the United States and its European allies months to deliver them to Ukraine. The Ukrainian air defense received its first German Iris T systems in October 2022, Nassams and Aspidae in November, but the delivery of Patriot systems took a while. After talks, which the Ukrainian foreign minister Dmytro Kuleba portrayed as the most difficult diplomatic issue that Kyiv had faced since the start of the war, the United States finally officially declared its pledge to send a Patriot battery to Ukraine in December. In January, Germany followed suit, but these two batteries arrived in Ukraine only in April 2023. Negotiations on offensive weapons like tanks and armored vehicles took even longer. It was a kind of watershed moment regarding Western military support to Ukraine. Portable anti-tank guns and air defense systems are essentially defensive weapons, while HIMARS was given at the time when Ukraine needed a battlefield solution to the over-concentration of Russian artillery in Donbass. Tanks and armored fighting vehicles are offensive weapons, which many in the West were initially reluctant to give to Ukraine, fearing that Russia may interpret it as direct Western involvement in the war and retaliate in some fashion. Still, the Ukrainian army needed Western tanks, armored fighting vehicles, and armored personnel carriers to have a higher chance of success in their offensive operations. As early as March 2022, less than a month into the full-scale invasion, Ukraine's President Zelensky famously asked his Western allies for 1% of all your planes, 1% of all your tanks. Little did he know that it would take 10 months for Ukraine's allies to finally pledge modern Western tanks, and 17 months to get a definitive answer about fighter jets. While the Ukrainian officials have been publicly and privately asking for tanks and other assault vehicles since the start of the war, these messages started getting more persistent towards the end of 2022, when the Ukrainian army was making its plans for a counter-offensive on the Azov Sea. For months, European countries waited for the United States to lead the effort of pledging the first modern Western-made battle tanks. Still, the Biden administration insisted that the US-produced Abrams main battle tanks were not the best fit for the needs of the Ukrainian army. The deputy spokesperson of the Pentagon, Singh, indicated that German Leopard 2 tanks are a better fit for the AFU, since it's a little bit easier to maintain, they can maneuver across large portions of territory before they need to refuel, the maintenance and the high cost that it would take to maintain an Abrams, it's just, it just doesn't make sense to provide that to the Ukrainians this moment. While the Biden administration pushed the German government to make the first step, Berlin insisted that America had to go first. The German Chancellor Schultz stated that, We're never doing anything just by ourselves, but together with others, especially the United States. This stalemate between Ukrainian allies persisted for weeks, giving the Russian army additional precious weeks to further solidify their defensive lines, lay more mines, and build more strongholds. Now, it is worth noting that Russia was already busy doing that even before the tank talks between Ukraine and its allies intensified. But if the United States, Germany and others were going to send their tanks to Ukraine regardless, doing that earlier would have made a significant difference on the battlefield. Imagine how the situation on the Zaporizhia front would have been different had Ukrainians received Western-made main battle tanks not in the spring to summer of 2023, but in the autumn of 2022 at the time when the AFU was actively proving its capability to conduct offensive operations, and when the Russians had not dug in so deeply in the Zaporizhia Oblast yet. This is all in hindsight. What really happened is that Britain made the first move by pledging Challenger 2 tanks, with Germany and other European countries following suit by promising several dozen Leopard 2 tanks, while the United States promised Abrams 1 tanks, which Ukraine has yet to receive. Notably, in December 2022, the Ukrainian commander-in-chief Valery Zelushny publicly stated in an interview that Ukraine would need 300 tanks, probably meaning modern main battle tanks, but has received less than half of what he hoped for. Now, only two contentious issues with regard to military aid to Ukraine remained – long-range missiles and Western-made fighter jets. For months, Ukraine has been requesting both. The Ukrainian government has specifically been asking for ATA CMS long-range missiles, privately and publicly, for over a year. It is reported that Lockheed Martin produces exactly 500 ATA CMS annually, 
which are being sold to American allies across the globe. According to the Politico article from February 2023, the Pentagon has already informed Ukrainian officials that they don't have any spare ATA CMS to give to Ukraine. The US has held a similar stance on F-16 fighter jets since the start of the war. In 2023, the rumors of F-16s for Ukraine started to gain some steam, but in January, Biden threw cold water on these rumors by simply saying no to reporters when asked about the supply of fighter jets to the AFU. Apparently, the US government continued resisting the transfer of F-16s to Ukraine, including by its European allies, until in August, the Netherlands and Denmark officially pledged these fighter jets to Ukraine after the United States authorized this transfer. Ukraine will probably get F-16s sometime in the first half of 2024, after its pilots complete their training. All this criticism does not deny the clear fact that the United States and NATO allies have provided massive military and economic aid to Ukraine, without which Ukraine would not stand much chance of preventing the Russian victory in this war. But this support does not make the West immune from criticism. Many think that since the United States and European countries have already made a strategic decision to support Ukraine, they might as well do more. What makes people think that the West can do more? First, the biggest concern is related to slowness in Western decision-making. Once Ukraine proved that its army was capable of fighting and defeating the Russian army, Western concerns about arming Ukrainians in vain should have dissipated. The rate of losses of Western equipment by the Ukrainian army is also adequate to the intensity of combat. Surely, scenes of tank and armored vehicle losses at the start of the counteroffensive were bad optics for Ukraine. Still, generally speaking, the Ukrainian command has managed to avoid disproportionately high losses of Western equipment. Russia has yet to manage to destroy a single HIMARS system, despite it being a high-value target for the Russian army. Western equipment has retained its attractiveness to potential buyers. Hence, Western countries could have provided tanks and F-16s earlier, giving a better chance for the Ukrainian army to defeat the Russian forces on the Zaporizhia front and change the course of the war dramatically. The second most common criticism is the amount of equipment the West gives Ukraine. For instance, the United States has promised only 31 Abrams tanks, whereas according to Radio Liberty, the US Army has 2,509 Abrams with an additional 3,700 in storage. According to the military expert Dr. Frank Ledwidge, if Abrams does not go to Ukraine, they will never be used. Surely the US could have pledged more. After all, Ukraine is actively diminishing the offensive potential of the Russian army, which is the main threat to NATO's Eastern and Central European members. Statements of the Biden administration officials and the Trump administration before that demonstrate that their main foreign policy focus is slowly diverting from Eastern Europe, Russia, Central Asia and the Middle East to China and the Pacific. The weakening of Russia and the ultimate defeat of the Putinist regime would allow the USA to focus more on their new geopolitical priorities. Ukraine's resistance against the powerful Russian army has galvanized NATO and renewed its purpose. NATO has been a target of criticism, including from Western leaders, for its obsoleteness. But Putin's unprovoked attack has brought countries like Finland and Sweden into the fold, reminding European elites that their commercial and energy links with Russia do not change the reality that Moscow remains their biggest threat. Concerns about delays in supplies, and at times the small amount of equipment pledged, have prompted an increasing number of commentators to question whether the United States really wants Ukraine to win the war as soon as possible, with as few losses as possible. The most common explanation is that the United States is doing its utmost to find a fine balance between enhancing the combat capabilities of the Ukrainian army and avoiding escalation, along with making sure that the war does not spill over to other countries, particularly NATO members. The Ukrainian government usually makes its requests public, and after several weeks or months of back and forth, the Western governments get the feel of the Russian reaction to the supply of new types of weapons. According to the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, Pavlo Klimkin, there are many reasons which stop many from going all the way. It's a threat of escalation, both nuclear and non-nuclear, for instance using chemical weapons. But the reaction is always the same. Several apocalyptic comments by Medvedev and chief propagandists, and a generic statement by the Russian Ministry of Defense or Putin's spokesman Peskov about how this new delivery will escalate the conflict. 
While the Western governments are right to do their due diligence to avoid a nuclear escalation by the Kremlin, it should be clear that there are myriad reasons why Putin probably will not use nuclear weapons. We have already made a video on the unlikeliness of a nuclear strike by Russia, so we're not going to go into details here. Another explanation behind the slowness and indecisiveness of the West is the late Cold War era consideration that the disintegration of Russia should be avoided. For all its troubles in conventional warfare, Russia still possesses the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Any instability in Russia carries a threat of nuclear weapons going loose, as was indicated by reports about the attempts of Wagner fighters to take possession of nuclear weapons in Voronezh during their march on Moscow. In the 1990s, it took joint efforts of Russia, the United States and European states to make sure that all nuclear weapons scattered throughout the former USSR republics were returned to Russia. Contrary to popular belief, Western governments were not fully comfortable with the disintegration of the USSR. In 1991, the US President Bush Sr. visited Kyiv and warned Ukrainian MPs against declaring independence. Former Ukrainian official Alexei Aristovich argued, the West does not need 30 small states, where 30 Kedarovs are fighting for the nuclear briefcase. He added, They fear instability. They fear not only disintegration, but what happens later, under which conditions, who will come to power, who will control Russian weapons, and many other questions. This argument makes sense. Nuclear non-proliferation has always been at the top of American foreign policy priorities. It is not a given that Russia will collapse into several states, but losing to Ukraine will arguably lead to problems for Putinist Russia. The legitimacy of Putin's power relies on stability, decent living standards thanks to oil and gas revenues, and making Russia great again. There are serious questions about Putin's ability to deliver the latter two at this moment, which may also lead to the crumbling of stability. And it is not outrageous to think that the weakened legitimacy of Putin and economic problems in Russia would make secession for oil-rich republics like Tatarstan or strongman-ruled despotates like Chechnya attractive. It is an unpredictable scenario, requiring the United States and other nuclear powers to carry out additional work to ensure that nuclear weapons and infrastructure are safe. Another argument of commentators claiming that the West does not want Ukraine to win sooner than later is that the United States wants to keep Russia busy in Ukraine for as long as possible, to stifle it and make it a geopolitical non-factor in the long run. The idea is that the war in Ukraine forces Putin to commit basically all of his military machines to Ukraine, preventing the Kremlin from dedicating resources elsewhere. Russia's influence in the South Caucasus, exerted through the Armenia-Azerbaijan War, or in Moldova through another secessionist region of Transnistria, has waned since the start of the war. Along with that, the continuation of the war in Ukraine further weakens Russia and depletes its capabilities for modern warfare, forcing it to rely on Soviet-era weapons and equipment increasingly. The longer the war goes, the weaker Russia's military and the economy stifled by sanctions get. It also pushes the EU and European members of NATO closer to the USA in the face of a Russian threat. The final explanation behind the incumbent US policy regarding military aid to Ukraine is that the West lacks a coherent long-term strategy. It wants Russia to weaken for the aforementioned reasons, but does not really have a clear view of what Ukrainian victory looks like and what weapons it needs to ensure that. The Western military aid does not follow a long-term strategy, but is simply reactive to Kyiv's needs on the battlefield. Russia is picking up the pace of aerial strikes on Ukraine, let's send them air defense. Is Ukraine planning a counter-offensive? Let's give them a few tanks then. The different interests of different members of the Western coalition make shaping a unified long-term strategy on support to Ukraine even more complicated. As the US Congress Committee Chairman Michael McCall said in June, there is no reason to give Ukraine just enough to bleed, but not enough to win. If we're going to be helping them, either go all in or get out. The Ukrainian army has now proved that it is a competent army, more than capable of successfully using modern Western weapons. The West is providing invaluable support, which is at times slow and insufficient, failing to put Ukraine in the best possible position. If it intends to help Ukraine win as soon as possible, its decisions need to be faster and more plentiful with a minimum of bureaucracy involved. More videos on this topic are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and press the bell button. 
please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.